Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. I find it interesting that we write software for long-running business processes and workflows in a linear way, meaning we write code that performs one step after another. Often, this leads to writing batch jobs or recurring jobs that query your database, looking at current and historical state, and then acting upon it. But batch jobs can be a nightmare. Usually they're running off hours or at night, of course, when you're sleeping, and get ready for a pager alert when that batch job starts failing. So what's the solution? Well, one solution is modeling future events. I gave a webinar with particular software, the Makers Event Service Bus, to talk about the challenges of batch jobs, how you can move a process away from them, as well as some real world use cases on how to model future events. So here's the webinar, and if at any point watching it, you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. Make sure to stay to the end, because I do answer some questions. Hello again, everyone, and thanks for joining us for another particular software live webinar. My name's Adam Ralph. Today, I'm joined by Derek Comartin, who's going to talk about topics such as the challenges with recurring batch jobs, how to move a business process away from batch processing, and real-world use cases for modeling future events. Just a quick note before we begin, please use the Q&A feature to ask any questions you may have during today's live webinar, and we'll be sure to address them at the end of the presentation. We'll follow up offline to answer any questions we won't be able to answer during this live webinar. Uh, we're also recording the webinar, and everyone will receive a link to the recording by email. Okay, let's stop looking in the past and start telling the future. Over to you, Derek. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. So the talk in and of itself, like as Adam just mentioned, relates to batch processing, but kind of the takeaway that I hope I can convey a little bit here is just to be thinking about kind of workflows and your business processes that really kind of drive your system. And just it's just a little switch of how you may think of them that can really change how you write your systems and your apps. So everything I'm talking about today, generally for the most part, is kind of in line with everything that I have on my blog at codeopinion.com, as well as my YouTube channel, where pretty much they go hand in hand. Every blog, I pretty much have a video for, vice versa. And they all kind of revolve around a lot of what I'm talking about today, messaging, just general software architecture and design, boundaries, those types of things. So if you're interested, kind of like at the end of this, in kind of discovering more of what I'm talking about, you can check out the blog as well as my YouTube channel. All right, so I think most people, when we're especially when we're developing systems or thinking about what our processes are, what, what they look like, what it means in our system, we're generally thinking about how I always used to think about it or how I still think about it until I kind of flip that switch a little bit, which I'm hoping that you'll get out of this, is thinking about your system for the most part as the way it resides right now, how you want things to execute at this very moment in time. So that can be a user, you know what I mean, performing some action where you're sending some type of command to your system where you want to mutate state, have some different side effect or some action that you actually, that the user wants to do or the system needs to invoke. And then from there, in kind of our event-driven world, I mean, publishing events, having other parts of our system or parts of that workflow, pick up those events, and can I either have some event choreography or orchestration to, to basically move these processes along? But in doing so, like we're always thinking about, okay, I want to execute this command. Maybe then from there, like I said, we derive some events that we publish and then we consume those and react to those. But we're always kind of in this mode, especially when we're writing these, this code that is going to be doing these, uh, this workflow, is we're generally thinking about it as right now or historically, um, the things that have happened. And the shift in that and kind of what this is, is there's kind of other ways to think about this. So, and I don't really blame us for this because even if we understand the full process, we're working with generally our database, which is what? It's storing current state usually. Even if we're storing kind of historical or more transactional information, and we can see history of what happened. We're still looking at, at present time the way things are in our system, and we're not really thinking so much about the future. But in a lot of situations, we can be thinking about the future uh, because we understand what the business process is, and we know that certain things are going to occur. 
But again, when we're kind of thinking of in, in batch jobs and which I'll get into here is we're generally looking at kind of that, this, the state of the system, what it looks like right now when something executes. And it's not just as it's executing, it's as we're actually writing it, as we're writing our application code, is we're doing so with the thought that we're looking at a current database, that we're looking at current state. So we're not necessarily looking so much about what needs to happen, just what is happening right now, like what's the state of the system. So like I said, there's kind of a, a, a shift, or I'm hoping a, a little bit, I'm planting a seed kind of in your mind with this talk, that there is certain kind of workflows in your system that are occurring, especially if you're using them, for, like if you're using batch jobs to, to perform some types of actions that need to occur, that you could really think about executing them in the future and programming it that way, programming it into your system to kind of get out of the batch job kind of scenario, which I'll talk about has its issues. So I'm gonna be using some real world examples that all kind of happened within, one of the main ones I'm gonna be using here, I'll talk about in a minute, was, something that had occurred recently, but I love examples because especially real world ones that are not made up and none of them are, is I hope they can translate that you can understand them as simple as they are, because um, usually some of these workflows are not simple, uh, but you can translate them into kind of your, your own system and just see, okay, yes, I, I get the gist of this. We have this kind of process in ours that is complex, troublesome. We do some batch processing for this. And maybe we can get away from that using some of the things I'm talking about. But I hope my examples, you can just relate to them, use them kind of as a, as a way to think about your own system and where this might be applicable. So the key to this really is I had this, I don't know, realization somewhat earlier this year when I was doing some online ordering. Typically, I'm doing online ordering and I'm just immediately buy now, ship to my house, everything gets so uh, gets delivered so quickly now that it's not really much of a thought. So as I was going through this um, use case, and I'll kind of go through it, it kind of dawned on me then of, oh yeah, like this is, this business process, this makes sense. While it's intuitive, I guess, it's not immediately easy to see how you would implement kind of online ordering. So specifically what I was doing was, sitting at my desk, just like I am now. And I needed to get something from like a big box hardware type store, which I give away, I think in one of these slides where what it is. So yeah, this was back in February. Um, and I was just ordering one item. Now, I guess luckily for me, I kind of got a little bit more of the gist of this is because I have worked in warehousing and distribution. So I have a little bit of a background that which just made me, I think, in, immediately think, oh, I wonder how this process is actually um, written in terms of their system. So I placed this order, or I was just on the website, and I was looking for one particular item. Um, and the store's not actually too far from me. So I'm like, well, instead of, like, and I needed it that day, instead of waiting to get it delivered to me, I figured, okay, I'll just look online. It shows that my particular store, and actually a few different around me, and it shows me the quantity on hand of the item I was looking for. Now, it's a little deceiving because the quantity on hand that you see on the website is what the store or what the system believes that they actually have on hand, like sitting on the actual shelf. So the idea would be that, okay, it said that they had one of this item. And the reason there was only one is because it was on clearance. And I was kind of a little bit concerned that maybe the item wouldn't be really there or it would be damaged. And that's important to note because even though it said, oh, there's one on hand. I mean, the point of truth really isn't what the system says. It really is what's actually on the shelf. And that's because in any type of warehouse or any time where you have actual inventory, um, unfortunately stuff does break, packages could be open. And I didn't really want an open package per se. I definitely didn't want a broken product that I was looking for. Or maybe unfortunately, that item really wasn't there or wasn't in the location it should be. Um, so it may be hard to find. That's also happened a lot. So I was taking a gamble here saying, okay, well, I'm not gonna go to the store directly because maybe what, what if any of those scenarios are the case? So I'm gonna do an online order for pickup. So what happens here is I get this immediate um, confirmation email like you would expect. And the interesting thing that they say here is that when my item is ready for pickup, 
or on their way that I'll get another email. And this kind of makes sense because what needs to happen is when somebody at the store realizes I placed this online order, they need to then go get that item for me. They need to go to the wherever it is located in the store. And hopefully it's a, it's a good, like it's not damaged or anything and it's actually there. And they basically take in that item off the shelf and put it into a designated area, at which point they clearly do something in their system to say, we've reserved this item for you. And essentially now you can come pick up your order because we have your item available to you. So really what they're doing is just creating a reservation. They're basically reserving that item for me. And what's interesting with this, it's really only for a period of time, right? Like they're only reserving this item. It's not like they're just going to take it and I, I don't come in and pick it up. So what they have here is at the, in the bottom box, they say that we recommend picking your items within seven days of the date that was ready to, for pickup, which I believe, yeah, it was on the third. Um, and if it's not possible, contact your local low store. So that's clearly where I ordered it from. Um, and then the bold part here is that if you do not pick it up, that item up, um, you'll be refunded and then the item will be placed back onto the shelf. So this kind of makes sense because it's like any reservation. If you think about, you know, I mean, going to a restaurant, making a re reservation, what are they reserving for you? A table. If you don't show up, say at whatever their threshold is, say 30 minutes after your reservation, they're going to free up that table. So maybe somebody else walking in can, can have that open table. So really it, all this is, is just a reservation. And I thought that was interesting in the sense of like, well, how, okay, now I understand how this works. I understand how the quantity in hand, the motions that they're going through. How would you actually implement this? Specifically, how would you implement the expiry of the reservation? So at some point, you're going to have to look at all the orders that have not been picked up. And I think this is a use case where immediately you would kind of jump to thinking of a batch job. So whether some people call it a batch job, a cron job, some scheduled task, they're going to be something that's reoccurring that you want to do on some periodic basic uh, basis that you need to execute some work. You need to do some things. So in my particular case, this would be it needs to figure out which orders have not been uh, completed, essentially, where somebody hasn't actually come in and pick up their order so that they can refund them. And then market the item some way so that the store knows that they can go up, uh, put that item back on the shelf. So there's a lot of different scenarios like this. But again, it goes back to where I was talking at the beginning, which is we want to look at the state of the system on some periodic basis. And we're kind of looking historically to figure out what we need to do. Now, that's, that's one way of dealing with it if you go down kind of this batch job scenario. But in any... In most batch jobs that I've ever worked on in any system, I'm going to talk about some of the issues here. And I, again, it, I hope you can relate to these, especially if you've been working on batch jobs. So how would this work? Well, in any type of system, we're making some type of state changes. Say it's like creating our order. So we make some uh, order in our database, whatever type of database you're using. There's some record of that. Then going through the process still, we did that reservation, we flagged our order as now it's maybe some state of kind of pending or waiting for pickup. And then we have some type of other, it could be a separate process. It could be, again, something that's running periodically, whatever that uh, basis is. Let's say for my example, it's just daily. But we have some worker process that is going to go reach out to our database, get the relevant data that it needs, those orders that are kind of sitting there expired. And maybe it gets all that data and then it iterates over them by one by one and then doing whatever it needs to do, canceling the order. And then there's probably other, some other uh, action that needs to do related to the refund of the payment, which gets more complicated. And while it gets more complicated, because there's many things that have to happen, the concern here is you're doing this work, there's many different orders that you need to process, and then there's a failure. How do you handle the failure? So this is probably the biggest headache is in batch processing, is if you're doing things in mass, like in an actual batch, how do you handle if there's a failure right in the middle of it? Especially in this case, if we're doing refunds, well, if those were occurring and then we're trying to make state changes, we're kind of, we don't want to be in this inconsistent state of we were able to do the refund, but we didn't update the database. So there's a lot of concern about, about actual failures and how we're going to handle them. 
So you could think of this just like really simple pseudocode here. Um, simple just to fit on a slide, but as I illustrated, you could think, okay, we're just gonna fetch out those orders where they're waiting for pickup. The expiry is earlier than right now. And then we just iterate over those and then we cancel the order and then we save changes. So we think this is good because, well, if there is something, some type of failure, maybe canceling throws for some reason or save changes uh, throws or we lose connection to the database, whatever the case may be, if there's a failure right in the middle of this, we could essentially rerun the job and we should be able to pick up where we left off and just be getting kind of the orders that we still need to cancel. But again, this is simplified because I'm not doing anything with the payments, which uh, kind of complicates this whole thing. But then you also have the issue of, okay, well, if this fails, where are you defining the retry? If you have this in some simplistic way, okay, it failed. You got to define that you want to retry it. How many times do you want to retry it? Um, do you want to do some exponential back off? There's a lot of thought that has to go into when these batch jobs fail and really how you want to handle them. So you may think, okay, well, the next kind of logical step here is, yeah, it's a batch job, but I really want to um, kind of execute this more in isolation where I have each individual order being canceled on its own. That way, if there's a failure to say one order, it doesn't affect the entire batch. So really what we've turned our batch into is just kind of like this Kickstarter that again, we're running once a day and it's just gonna get the order IDs um, kind of in the same type of query, just get the specific order IDs. And then we're gonna iterate over those and then we're gonna send a cancel order message um, to our queue. That way we can de deal with each message is just a specific cancel order command that we are gonna invoke and we can deal with that in isolation. So if there's a failure to one cancel or one order, it doesn't necessarily, depending on what the failure is, it, might not, it will potentially not affect all the other ones. So if we had a hundred orders that we're canceling, maybe one only has a failure. Then we can kind of deal with failures in terms of those individual orders, independently with retries, back offs, dead letter queues, et cetera. So the typical way you'd kind of think about how you wanna handle failures with messages. So this sounds great, but even if you do this, <laughs> there's issues. Uh, and the issues that I'm, two of the primary ones that I'm gonna describe here, um, again, seemingly for me have been in every case of doing any type of batch work, any type of batch jobs. The first is concurrency. So you are executing batch jobs, and let's say for simplistic states here, let's say that they're just, they're more on a periodic basis. So maybe you're doing something every hour. Well, you execute your batch job, it's automatically getting triggered every hour on the hour. And that batch job only takes 15 minutes to run, only, <laughs> but it takes 15 minutes to run. As time goes on, and you're really, if, you're, if you don't have proper, Kind of visibility and, and metrics and, and alarming to how these are actually running. That first job only took 15 minutes. It ran again, say we're talking like every day it's, it's doing this hourly, but over time your system grows, there's more volume, there's more actual work to be done. That batch job all of a sudden, instead of taking 15 minutes, is creeping up, it's taking longer and longer. Let's now say it's taking 30 minutes. And you keep going to this point where all of a sudden your batch job is taking longer than what the actual interval is. So all of a sudden you are executing a batch job, say processing these orders to cancel these orders, and you haven't even completed it. And then another job is actually already kicked off already. So in both of my use cases of kind of those simplistic code examples, they're both susceptible to this, to this. whether I was iterating over them, um, whether I was creating jobs that are now still sitting in the queue and they're not completely processed yet, um, you have this concern now of just concurrency and how you want to deal with it. More specifically, the way that this usually happens is you don't realize this is going to happen. So it's not like you're ri initially writing um, this code to cancel an order to think about concurrency that you would have two um, messages being trying to be processed at the same time. It's not necessarily something that you're thinking about because it's, oh, this has been working for months. Everything's fine. And then all of a sudden, you have concurrency issues to deal with. Probably the, besides that, that one's a sleepy one, but the the sneaky one, I should say. The other one really just is, is handling and load. 
most of the times that you're doing batch processing, seemingly when you decide to schedule when it's going to run, it's always at night, especially if you're in a system that kind of has more activity during the like the day hours or work hours, depending on what your system is. And it's not really, say, 24-7 or globally. Is that, oh, well, where are you going to put it? Well, I'm going to run it at 3 o'clock in the morning because that's when we really kind of have the lowest point of any load that we're dealing with. But what ends up happening there is you're going to be spiking. You're, you're going to see in your system, obviously, you're doing a ton of work. And kind of the same scenario with concurrency is because if you have more and more volume, which hopefully you do, that means your system's growing, there's more activity. Um, this can start bleed. Unfortunately, if you're doing more and more batch processing off hours, you're spiking not just from that one job, but many different jobs uh, to all different resources. So it might not just be kind of CPU compute, but it's also any other resources like your database, queues, whatever that you're using that you're also kind of flooding with work off hours because you don't want to interfere with kind of the, the user facing stuff. But what happens again with volume, this over time starts bleeding into kind of operational hours. We're expecting load to be at a certain level and you start bleeding into that. So if volume increases here, our peak just doesn't stay as a peak. It kind of keeps going out potentially into kind of working hours. So now what do you end up doing? Well, let's just move it back a little bit farther. Let's start it at 11 a.m. You're not really solving the problem necessarily. You're just kind of shifting it um, to at some point you really have to address it. So I just want to take a quick break here to kind of explain some of the issues um, that I think are the primary ones with batch jobs. I don't know, Adam, if you've run into any or if you have any thoughts about batch jobs yourself. Well, I, I was wondering, Derek, um, you mentioned in the description of the webinar about getting pager alerts, you know, kind of in the middle of the night when a batch job is having problems or, you know, is failing or something. I'm really curious. Has that actually happened to you before? I think that's the number one reason why pages, <laughs> why they have experienced pages occur. It's, and I was using that, that first example of concurrency. And while like, to me, that one is the, it's the sleepy one because it's a scenario where uh, kind of in the happy path and you're right, like you, you, the, your system's running, it's got a certain level of volume. This works fine. Um, and then all of a sudden you, you run into this. And there's either duplicate records, there's failures because of duplicates, um, however your system's set up. These types of pages, and again, because they are running in the middle of the night, like who really wants to be on, on you know, I mean, page or, or support in the middle of the night when you know you're going to get one of these? Um, it's just, it's not a good place to be in, especially when it creeps up on you. And it's the same thing with load. It, it can kind of creep up on you. Um, and again, if you have monitoring, you got to deal with it. Uh, maybe you've got different metrics for CPU load and database, et cetera. It's just what you'd rather be doing, which I'm going to talk about, is figure out how can we reduce some of this? How can we kind of remove this concurrency that's causing these issues? And how can we can kind of reduce um, the load and kind of level it out? So really what I was talking about with the reservation, it's the reservation pattern. And it's exactly kind of as I was describing it with that online order. So another way of thinking about it, instead of like in your own system, is anytime you want to create some lock, essentially on a resource, you want to create some time bound lock, some giving some guarantee that, hey, there's some type of resource, in my case, it was a product on a shelf, that I want to guarantee that I'm going to lock, I'm going to hang on to that lock. And at some point, there's going to be like that, it's going to be time down that it's really, it's automatically released if I don't complete whatever it is, right? So I had to go into the store to kind of um, pick up or actually complete my order, but there was that time bound guarantee that I had a seven days. So if you really just think about it like that, um, you can kind of look at this process a little bit differently. So the kind of the timeline that I had here was the very first thing when I placed that online order, Let's say there's some event that's published, um, that's my order placed. And that kicked off probably a bunch of different things. One of them was just that, that first email that I received that said, hey, great, thanks for your order. We'll send you another email when your actual order is ready for pickup. Likely, the store also had some notification that they actually had to go get that uh, and process that order for me. How they do that, I have absolutely no clue, but there's probably some indication to them that they need to go do it. 
So maybe that's just some employee periodically going to look at the system. Maybe there's something that gets notified to them. I'm not really sure, but clearly when they physically go and get the item off the shelf and reserve it for me, there's some indication that they're making in their system that that order is ready. Everything's been, all the product's been reserved and I can come pick it up. That's obviously what kicked off um, that event, that order reserved event is what kicked off the email um, that I could actually go pick up the order. And now when I physically went to the store, I don't know, it was like that later that day, I think, um, and I go and get my order. They're clearly checking me out. I've already been charged for it, so I don't have to give them my credit card or any type of payment. Um, that's essentially completing that reservation. My order really is kind of, I mean, there may be some order completion there that's happening, but really, if you want to think of it as a reservation, that's when I'm completing that reservation is when I physically go to the store and pick it up. We know we're done because that's the indication that they don't need to expire it. So these are the kind of three things on the happy path that really work. We don't need to think about batch jobs or anything here. It's just, okay, it's how you expect if everybody goes and picks it up. But there, it's not, that's not the case because we also need to expire. So when we're thinking about specifically about a res uh, reservation, the idea that you were reserving it, that's when the person was going to um, pick out the item. Or like I said, if you're thinking about a restaurant, it's like you calling up and reserving a table. There was that confirmation or the validation of that reservation. That's me going to the store and actually picking up the item. But we also have to deal with the expiry. How do we expire um, that order? and do the refund and put the item back on the shelf. So that expire portion is kind of that interesting part is that how do we actually do this without a batch job? And that's really where I'm getting into, you know you need to do this. If when you're physically writing the code for this, when you do that reservation, you know you need to do an ex potentially do an expiry in the future. So knowing that you can program and model this process that way of deciding at a given time, that you're going to do something in the future. You don't need to do some interval batch job looking at the state of your system to figure out if an order needs to be uh, canceled. You can decide in the future that you're already going to do it potentially if it hasn't been picked up. So what that looks like is, okay, our order was placed, but the moment that um, employee goes to the shelf to actually picks up the item, they're creating that reservation. What has to happen with a reservation? You need to expire it. So when we're creating that event, um, that order reserved event, and we're publishing that, we also at the exact same time can be creating a message that we want to consume in the future. And that can be our expire reservation. So we're defining that kind of along our timeline here. Immediately when an order reserved happened, we are immediately uh, going to basically send ourselves a message in the future. So what happens is as I actually come into the store and completed my reservation, all that really means is that when our expire reservation is actually still going to occur, we'll just look at the state of the system. We'll see, oh, okay, that order is completed. We don't actually need to do anything. And we just kind of exit early when we consume that message. No problem. If the order hasn't been completed and we haven't completed that reservation, then that's the work that we need to do related to the expiry in the case of uh, doing the refund and returning the product back to the shelf or flagging it that way so an employee does it. So this is what I mean by kind of thinking a little bit about, you know, when you're writing this process and you're actually in code writing this, is that you know what you need to do in the future. You can, I think it, the, the trouble is there is thinking, well, maybe not, maybe there's, it's conditionally, but you can still decide that you want to do it and then make that conditional portion of whether you actually do anything meaningful when it executes. So a way you can accomplish this is with delayed delivery. So I'm going to explain how it works. Um, and ultimately, End Service Bus provides an abstraction around this, which is wonderful. Um, but you do, I would recommend checking out um, the documentation. Say you're using Azure Service Bus or AWS SQS or RabbitMQ. Understand how it works under the hood because End Service Bus extracts this from you, which is awesome. And it just has kind of a very, I'll show some, I think I'll show an example here, but it's it's simplistic on how you're you're uh, leveraging it. But behind the scenes, it's doing end service bus is doing a lot of work for you. So the way, way this works is you have a center where you're going to be sending a message to your queue, and what you're doing is you're basically providing with that message 
how long you want to delay the delivery of it, hence the late delivery. So let's say in the case of when I was um, going to send that expiry, I can tell it, okay, I'm going to send this message to expire this, uh, this re reservation, this order at seven days. So that's what I'm including with my message when I send it. What happens here is that the consumer will never get that message until we've reached that timeline, that, that seven days. So seven days have to pass. So our consumer can be um, trying to get messages, but they won't be delivered to it because we haven't uh, elapsed that time. Once we finally do pass that seven days, at that point, our, our consumer will get that message delivered and then we'll be able to process it. So again, look at, read, and understand how the documentation works underneath the hood because there's some implications there on how it actually works. Um, but it's really simplistic in terms of the API on how you're doing this. Now, this sounds incredibly straightforward. And for the most part, it really is. It just really is a matter of thinking about, I know I need to do something in the future and basically be defining that you're going to do it. Um, and the key part about it, as I'll explain a little bit more, is just understanding when you actually do get that message delivered, you realize, okay, do I actually still need to do anything? I know I needed to back when I originally sent this, but I may not to, need to now uh, based on the state on the system, based on the state of the system. So now you can think of when you're doing this, there, like this is my old, the original kind of load peak. Um, that spike of doing that batch processing of, say, however many orders that we needed to cancel or whatever the work that you're doing. If you think of that now, we've eliminated the need for it because now what we're doing is that now that we're scheduling and delaying delivery of this message, it's just going to be executed at the time that, so if we, 10 o'clock in the morning, that item was, order was reserved and seven days later at 10 o'clock is when we're going to process that message. So we're not doing them all at four o'clock in the morning. We're doing them essentially seven days from the exact time, roughly, um, depending on how quickly you process them. It's going to be available at least uh, to be delivered to you to consume seven days from that moment or whatever you set your expiry as uh, to delay that delivery. So essentially what we do is we end up going from kind of this batch processing, processing all this work to really leveling things out where, where this peak was. Now, all these messages that we're, we need to expire, especially if they need to exit early, they're just kind of sprinkled through everywhere, likely when they're occurring during working hours there. So yeah, you're going to increase load over working hours a little bit, but again, it's kind of spread out throughout, um, throughout your working day rather than needing to be batch processed that night. So you can imagine how if you take a lot of your batch processing and do this um, that you were previously doing, and defining what you want to do in the future, um, you can really kind of just level that load and not have to worry about, to me, why you end up getting pages is because of usually high database CPU or different locking and uh, connections and transactions taking too long. Those are usually the most reasons why you end up having these database spikes and what they cause. And now you're just putting it throughout and kind of leveling it off through the normal work and normal processing and messages that you're normally doing. So that's kind of the biggest advantage is, is kind of load leveling and you're still doing everything in isolation, just like you're, you would normally with a message. So you get all those benefits of how you normally do things in your system. So at that point, before I jump in a couple more real world examples, um, Adam, I don't know if you had any thoughts about this so far. Well, it's certainly great to know we can avoid these page alerts. Um, <laughs> I, I'm wondering, so based on what you said, um, how, how does this look in code? Like if I'm actually going to try and do this in code, is this, a, is this a complex thing or? It's not. So that's the thing is that while this sounds incredibly simple in, in I think the biggest difficulty in this is really just thinking about your use cases, your processes and realizing where you can actually do this. So like I mentioned, a, a big portion of this is just kind of having oftentimes things are time bound. And the way you can do that with the delayed delivery is that you can create a, uh, do a request timeout and specifying your message. Uh, and then from there, you're specifying really how long you're going to be delaying. So in my example, this is just some sample code that I had from a video that I've done kind of on this. And this is just in a saga. And as you'd expect, after 10 seconds, I'm going to be executing this uh, timeout, 
and going to be able to do any additional actions that I need to perform. I have this other, uh, so I'm just handling this time out here for this actually particular type, this message. I also wanted to point out in comments here, there's other ways of doing this, which is just literally when you're sending a message, providing the delayed delivery width of kind of a timeout as well. You can have many different timeouts that you're requesting in a saga. Um, I just want to point out this way because there's different ways to do it, but I want to point out this way because another example um, that I'm going to show here. So let me jump back to some real world examples. So I'm gonna give two more um, and they're, they're different in nature. Um, but again, I, the, really the point of this is I hope they give some context. Um, obviously they're probably not the same scenarios you're in, but that you can relate a little bit to them, um, that you can think about your kind of your, maybe some sparks, some ideas about your own system. So, and then these are actually two that I've been in. So the first one, is something I experienced. Uh, again, this was relatively recently. So when we go back to that example of kind of like that time bound guarantee of something, and I think most people can probably relate to this in some way, if you have a system that has some type of user registration or some type of account set up. So what I was doing was I was signing up to a service for, I guess like money transfer, like do, to do bank transfers, that type of thing. And I've never done it before. I had no idea what I actually had to go through a part of this registration. So the first thing I actually did was just fill out your typical, you know what I mean, demographic data, my name, address, that type of stuff. Um, provide, I think, either like my email address or a username that I wanted to create uh, associated to my account. It's all pretty typical. And then from there, the next thing I had to do was I had to enter some more information. But you'll see as I was entering more information, what really also had to happen was that there had to be some expiry that had to be defined on how long this actual registration process could take. Um, just because I started it does not necessarily mean I was going to finish it based on all the things that needed to happen. So this is kind of like the same way where there's this process that has to happen and it has some type of life cycle where it can complete. But if it doesn't complete, there's likely some release or expiration of that registration so that maybe in a year from now or months from now, if I go through the registration, I don't start off where I was, it, nor would I probably want to because I need to probably enter all new information based on how the process goes. So there probably likely is say, okay, you got like a week to complete this. And then if you don't, we're going to, if you try to sign up again, you can go through a new registration. So the first thing I had to do was some type of ID verification. I remember having to like scan my, on my phone, like my driver's license or something like that. And then after that completed, I had to wait. And then I got like a push notification in the app on my phone that said, okay, you're good. You need to get to the next step. Then I had to do some type of bank verification, which um, again, took a little bit of time to complete. Once that was all done, then I actually kind of, everything was confirmed. Everything was completed. I could log in and I could start using the basically their service but if at some point i didn't finish this it could be because i realized oh my god i don't really want to go through this whole rigmarole or maybe there was an issue with my id verification or big verification you could see why this process wouldn't complete um and you're not just going to necessarily hang on and, and prevent somebody else from registering with say the same email address like I said, later on, maybe a week later or a month later, whatever the threshold that the is that the have, I want to be able to start this thing fresh. I don't necessarily want to continue on. And you could see if you had some type of record with my email address, you'd be like, oh, well, you can't you can't sign up again. You've already you've already started a registration. So this kind of allows you to kind of have some endpoint um, and always kind of define a start and end to some type of process. So again, it's just thinking about these types of processes that they do have a start and an end generally. It's never usually kind of um, infinite. There is some finite start and end to some of these things. So another one I want to describe is um, another real world use case that is a little bit different because it's not necessarily a start and an end, but you could see how you would do this in batch processing or you could do this with basically delayed delivery. So the idea here is that if you're think about a delivery of um, goods or whatever you say you're buying something online in certain parts of kind of logistics, freight delivery, um, there's some 
freight that's a little bit more valuable potentially um, that the customer, the shipper actually wants to keep track of where or wants to be informed of where their goods or freight is, say at an interval, let's say it's every 15 minutes, they want to know where it is. And by where it is, is this could be the locations of the actual vehicle, the truck that actually has the freight. It could be in a plane. Either way, there's usually devices that are sending GPS coordinates back to a system say, okay, I'm actually here driving down, say this highway or I'm in the air, et cetera. So if you were to think about this, how this process works, because we want to inform the customer, the shipper, this is where your freight is, maybe with ETA information, so they know that when it's actually going to get delivered. So as our kind of our point in time here, the first thing that's going to kick everything off is when that freight is actually out for delivery. It's going from the shipper to the constantly to the final destination. So we have this event that uh, starts, but we know we immediately right now want to schedule a delayed delivery for a message that we're going to consume that's going to basically uh, send whatever, an email, an SMS, a push notification, whatever the case may be, to the shipper, to the customer. So if you were thinking about batch processing, you just have something interval every 15 minutes, or you can immediately uh, schedule a message for delayed delivery. Let's call it a status update. So as time goes on, and let's say it's 15 minutes out. So at some point, we get a position update from the plane, the truck, whatever the case may be, that's giving us the GPS coordinates of where they are. And we persist that data to our database. So then when we actually get to the time of that 15 minutes, we get that message delivered and we can perform that status update. But what we immediately want to do is do the exact same thing. Because we're not using any type of batch processing, what are we going to do? We're just going to do the same thing. We're going to basically um, have another message for five minutes out that is going to execute in five minutes and we're just going to keep doing the same thing. So we get another position later on, gives us some GPS coordinates. We execute that message, um, uh, consume that message that status update, send another SMS or email, whatever, to the customer, letting them know the ETAs, et cetera. And we do the same thing. We just keep going with this. So we don't necessarily know when the end is. There is an end is when we actually deliver it, but we don't know when that's going to be. So we just keep having these status updates. We just keep sending these with a delayed delivery. We're executing them. And at some point, we're going to have the final event that the actual item is delivered. We're finished. This has actually completed everything. So at this point, once we've delivered, we're still going to run that last event. Um, or that message of status update, and we're going to consume it. But like I said, these, the, these messages aren't necessarily that you absolutely have to do something. You're going to be looking at, in writing code here, looking at the state of, say, the delivery of that shipment. See, oh, it's delivered. I don't need to do anything else. I don't need to send an email out. I don't need to send another uh, delayed message out. We're done at that point. So this one will really just execute, and that will be the end of it. So that's kind of like the, while there is a beginning and an end, Sometimes you know what the end is going to be potentially. Sometimes you don't, but you're just going to keep doing things along the way and just keep scheduling and, and delaying messages. So the biggest takeaway here is for me, if you get anything from this, I hope, is to think about these business processes that there generally is. They are finite generally. There is a start and an end. You may know the end. Um, or what the end could be depending on the scenario, right? Like it could be something actually completes what you would think is um, kind of the happy path. But there's also the other scenarios where there's kind of this time bound uh, end to something. And it could be time, it could be as my example where something else has to occur and you're just gonna keep uh, delay delivering messages out till something happens, something else happens, some other event stops that from occurring. So just thinking about these processes because I, I find most times you actually, can, not all the time, but most times you actually can uh, really think about something that you want to do in the future, rather than having some reoccurring batch job, looking at the state of the data, and then trying to figure out from it whether it should do something. You generally know when you're working in this, in, in writing the code for this, you generally know something actually does need to happen. And a way to do that is telling yourself in the future that you want to do something. So with that, um, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm not sure how many questions we got here, Adam, but more than happy to answer some. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of interesting questions coming in, actually. Uh, there's, there are two which are kind of related, so I'll kind of try and combine them a little bit. Um, uh, so we've got some people asking, um, can, you, can you 
how how do you visualize a state of the system that's uh kind of hidden either in saga state or in kind of messages that are in a sitting in a queue delayed to be uh, to, to be delivered at a later time um how do you how do you how do you kind of get some visibility over that yeah so i think that's a good question and i think that pertains to almost anything is <laughs> the key word there is visibility um but i don't really think of it that way because if you're looking at the state of the system, for example, these orders, um, and you're saying, okay, this order is kind of pending for two days. It was placed two days ago and it hasn't been picked up, but we reserved it. And that's something that's visual in your, like it's more so it's visual in your system. I, I wouldn't be so much concerned about, okay, what messages, delayed messages are sitting there because you know they're there. Um, really the state of your system is the state of your system. Like there's, there's really no reason why you should be so much concerned about like if, if you have the approach of testing and you know that messages are getting sent, um, there's really no reason to be concerned with, oh, there's all these messages sitting there for delayed delivery. Because even if, again, even if they're there and when they do, are consumed, the state of your system doesn't need them to do anything. That's what you're writing in those consumers of those messages to be doing that. Say, okay, I don't really actually need to do anything anymore. And you just exit early. Yeah, there is actually a related, sort of a related question to that about what happens when the message arrives, uh, because I've got a question here um, asking, what if batch process is based on multiple pretty complex conditions it checks before doing some action? So, for example, we're sending an email to a customer if they have failed their regular payment three days ago, but don't send it to the ones who have already paid or if the customer is in certain other states in the system um, at, at which point would you recommend to check those additional conditions? Well, I guess the way to exp I, I would think of this is related to this question, or you can kind of translate this to other ones is, I mean, you can kind of do all of these with a saga to begin with, but you're not thinking of it as you're thinking of it as um, to the individual, say customer, right? Like you're, the customer has this payment schedule or whatever the case may be. Um, there's other things, a part of your system that are kind of dictating whether the payment failed, whether the email needs to go out. So it's really about going down to the, that individual process of the individual customer. Um, I guess is how I would think about it. It's not necessarily um, like all these different conditions aren't necessarily happening all at the same time. Like there's different things that are occurring that you could be having in Saga State that dictates whether you actually need to take action on something when you d delayed something out to actually execute it. Okay, great. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, what if moving from a batch job with batch processing to event-based processing results in billions of events? <laughs> wow, that's, that's a lot of events uh, because, that, because of the type of domain, thus resulting in, a hu in huge costs. How would you handle that? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think the trade-off here, obviously, if you're doing batch processing, you're incurring, well, I guess it depends on how, what kind of costs we're talking about. If we're talking about like kind of cloud costs and usage, um, there probably likely would be some trade-off here in terms of when you're doing that batch processing and, and really spiking and hitting resources really hard, say whatever interval you're doing it in, um, in my experience, you're, you are, again, it, dep it depends on, it depends on how infrastructure, how, where this is deployed. Um, because if you're not really in a scalable uh, elastic way, you're generally paying the cost of kind of that peak for the batch processing. Um, say like it's like CPU bound stuff, for example, um, let's just say you're just using strictly like VMs, you're not doing anything serverless. So you're going to pay, if you're not auto scaling it, you're going to be paying for an instance that is, or containers that are, have the capacity for essentially the batch, like to process the batch. And oftentimes it's not necessarily executing. It's all the downstream services that are affected by it. That's usually when you mentioned like the pain. It's usually a cascading series of failures that cause it is, you know what I mean? Like you have, okay, some batch, the, the execution of understanding what you need to do, but it's the database, it's a cache, it's 
all these other things that you're you're flooding with requests. Um, is there like if you, all of a sudden you're creating billions of messages? Um, I mean, that's I a lot. You, right? That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you'd have to be looking at yeah. If it's if it's a cost factor, then I, I guess you'd have to be looking at what you're paying now versus then what it like what you think it'd be costing you. I guess um, if I envisage something with potentially billions of events, it's kind of say, it leads me to say, well, you know, this isn't this isn't the solution for every single problem out there. It's yeah. not a it's not a silver bullet, right? So if you if you genuinely have billions of events, maybe another solution is better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I've got another question here, which is interesting. Um, isn't delayed messaging the same? polling from the message infra standpoint so as messages need to be polled anyway in order to be verified if it is time to process it uh, say that again sir so i think i think what's being asked here is okay you, you you're delaying messages which go to the broker or, yep. or some kind of broker isn't that isn't that then the same as polling anyway because you're having to poll the broker i think this is yeah i think i think it's kind of um what I was, I got a question before similar to this is like, is it not just shifting the responsibility? I guess a little bit thinking of like internally, the, how, how the broker is working to decide to delay that message to you. Um, in, I guess in some sense, yes, but in some sense, it's that concern, you removing it from yourself um, versus doing it in batch. There's just a lot more involved if you're uh, if you're actually trying to figure out how to do it. Um, if you're doing it in batch, you're doing it in batch. Versus if it's spread out and the broker is dealing with when it's delivering that message to you, um, I'm fine with removing that concern from my own, you know, I mean, my app and my, dealing with that infrastructure. Well, I guess a broker is kind of doing that internally, so it can probably all but kinds of optimizations yeah. and you know the broker is all about message delivery, right? So which is fine. I would rather. <laughs> I would rather leave those capabilities to what it's used for, like if that's its purpose, rather than me trying to, yeah, work it out. And like I said, with all the different ways for failures, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour now. So I guess it's uh, probably time to wrap up. So um, any questions which we didn't uh, um, answer now, uh, we will follow up with you uh, later. Um, I, there were a couple of anonymous questions, but um, I'll see how we can follow up with those as well. So uh, thank you very much for attending this particular software live webinar. And uh, thanks to Derek for an excellent presentation. Uh, our colleagues will be speaking later this month at NDC in Oslo and Norway, at Techorama in Utrecht, the Netherlands, and online at .NET 4 Days, which is hosted in Ukraine. You'll also see more of the particular software team at our booths at the in-person events, and you can go to particular.net slash events to find us at a conference near you. So that's all we have time for today. On behalf of Derek Co. Martin, this is Adam Rouse saying goodbye for now and see you at the next particular software live webinar.